Well, good morning. morning. It just gets more fun all the time to be here. I don't know if you guys feel it, but I sure do. Oh, man. Does it feel like there's a, a shift in the atmosphere to anybody? I'm not just talking this morning. I'm talking like... A shift in the atmosphere. Seems like everybody I talk to is sensing this, is feeling this, is experiencing this. And man, we serve an amazing God. We serve a powerful God, that one, one that wants to be with us, that wants to spend time with us. Isn't that incredible? I, find, I just think it's so incredible. Here we are, just flesh, you know, carbon beings made from dirt, but made by the one that created everything. This morning, my message is titled, Get Ready. Get ready. Last week, Rod preached a message called Invitation, and it was excellent. It was so good. You know, the Spirit of the Lord is moving. He's moving in this place. He's moving on this place, through this place. He's always with us. He doesn't leave us. He's always around us. Something that I've been thinking a lot about lately is how we ask God to give us more of Him. Really, though? Really? He's given us all of Him. And the Word says that He's everywhere we go. We can't go to the highest heights or to the lowest depths He's there. As far as the east is from the west, he's there. No matter where you go, he's there. Why are we asking him for more of him? If God gives a gift, it's a good and perfect gift. Now, I'm not saying that we can't get more of the Holy Spirit, that we can't get more um, in tune with him, guys, but... What I am saying, what's really just burdening on my heart is the fact that we have to get ready. We have to get ready. Moses, God told Moses that I'm going to pass by, but I'm going to put you in this cliff because if you see my face, it'll kill you. Are we ready? Are we ready inside? Are we ready for more of him? for more of a move of Him? Are we ready to experience more of Him? I better pray first. Mm. Good morning, Father. God, we love You so much. Help us to love You more. God, I pray that you will prepare our hearts, that you will prepare our minds to receive more from you, to experience more of you, God, to be used more mightily by you, Lord. Help us to give ourselves up so that we can get more of you. Help us to die more to our flesh so we can get more of you. Help us to put ourselves out of the way so we can get more of you, God, so that we can we can experience you more the way that you want us to experience you, God. Lord, I pray that we won't just say the words that, that we crucify our, our flesh, Lord. We crucify ourselves. We die to ourselves so that you can live through us. God, I pray that those won't just be words, but that they will be truth and they will be life-giving, Lord. 
that we will experience that actual truth, Lord, that we will experience those things, that we will die to our flesh, we'll die to our pride, Lord, that we will put those things aside so that we can experience you more. Lord, I pray that you will just put me aside today and that you will shine through, that you will speak through this body, this fleshly body. Lord, I pray that you will just just allow your words to flow out. Allow your thoughts and your heart to flow out today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title is Get Ready. The subject really is Touching the Heart of God. Touching the Heart of God. Hmm. Last week, Rod said, how do we reorient our lives around the Lord instead of around our own lives? I think that that's something that we have to ask ourselves every single day. Every single day, we have to ask ourselves, how, how today do I orient my life around what God wants for me, around what God's made me for, around what He's created me for? Because if I don't, there's no way I'm going to accomplish what He has for me. If I don't orient my life around what He wants for me, then it's not going to happen. I will not accomplish it. We have to seek Him first. We have to want Him and desire Him more than we want and desire our own flesh, more than we want and desire our own wants. I'm not going to try to re-preach your message, but there was so much good stuff in it yesterday or last week. Um, one of the verses that, that Rod brought up was Luke 12, 35 through 36. Uh, 36, and it talks about being dressed and ready for service and your flames burning so you can go with him. I think sometimes we read these verses, we read the word of God, and it, we just skim over it. Like we just, we read it out loud, but we don't let it settle deep into our hearts. We don't make it part of us. And these words... They give life. They teach us and tell us what we can do so that we will be ready when he comes, so that we will be prepared when he comes. God talks about, in Luke 14, 15, he talks about a great banquet. I don't know if it's this jet that's causing static or what. Those are really getting on my nerves, so it's probably getting on your guys' nerves too. Don't worry, that'll be the last thing that comes off, even if it does static. Anyway. In Luke 14, 15, Jesus tells us about this great banquet. He's telling these parables for us. They're for us. He's speaking to us. And, you know... Before I get into that, I remember whenever I was a kid, and the church that I went to, um, we didn't hide the Holy Spirit, we didn't hide His gifts, we didn't hide His um, leading, uh, His directing, the attributes, we, we didn't. We didn't do everything right, but we certainly didn't hide any of it. Um, and so I grew up hearing God put on people's hearts this word, and speaking out in tongues. Speaking in tongues is an utterance that the Holy Spirit is speaking out of us. It's definitely nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be scared of. It's definitely nothing to hide. If any of you guys remember my, my message on the Holy Spirit a while back, I don't know, a year or something ago, I'm extremely passionate about the Holy Spirit because there's nothing like it. 
There's nothing like it. It's God living and working in us and through us. He, he perfects all of our imperfections. When we allow him to just break out and do what he wants to do, it might not look like what we think it's going to look like. It might not sound like what we think it's going to sound like. But it's perfect because it's literally God doing it. And the word tells us that some will have the gift of speaking in different tongues. And that whenever these things do happen, that someone else in the church, if you feel the, the interpretation on your heart, then you should give it. But if no one speaks out and gives that interpretation, then the one who actually spoke that should speak out and give the interpretation because God will give it. Does he know what he's saying whenever he's very first speaking out? Absolutely not. Nope. And you won't either. But if no one else, and I believe that there are people in here that when God's speaking that out through someone, that God's telling someone else what to say, he's telling them what that meant. And if he's telling you and you're getting that, it's this impression. It's this impression like you know that you know that you know that this is what, that was, this is what God was saying. And if you do, if you ever get that, then be bold, step out and speak it. Let God use you because then you will be blessed by it. It's okay if you don't. It's okay because then God will give it to somebody else that will speak it out and he knows your heart. He knows your desire. He knows um, who you are inside and out. So he's not, a, he's not upset with you. He's not ashamed of you. He's not any of that stuff, but he wants to be able to bless you through it. Okay, so don't be afraid. And just give it. And um, thank you. Thank you so much because it, it took me right back. It took me right back to, to where I, I was whenever I first started this relationship with God. Even as a kid, hearing, hearing these people speak out in tongues and stuff, I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, this is God moving. This is God working. Um, my uncle tells a story, and he's told it in our men's Bible study and stuff, so I'm, I'm, it's okay for me to share it here but uh he talks about whenever he was i think like 16 or something there was a sweet lady in our church i love her so much uh, she's going to be with god now but he would god would speak out of her in tongues and and for the longest time my uncle thought this isn't real it's not actually true you know like she's just doing this for attention or whatever and then one day he was up playing i think he might have been playing on the worship team or something like that and um he said she spoke out this word, and he knew, like, it. God just hit him with it, and he felt like he was supposed to say it. He was supposed to say it, and he just did it. Hit, anybody ever been there? I've been there. Like, maybe not with interpreta- uh, interpreting tongues, but definitely like that with several things. And uh, he knew that he was supposed to speak this out, and he's like, surely this isn't God, because I've always thought that this was bogus, that this wasn't real. And then somebody else, I think it was actually her that gave the interpretation because nobody else did. And it was exactly what God was putting on his heart and in his mind to say. And he was just like, and he say, just broke down weeping because God was specifically talking to him and made him realize, I use this woman. I speak through this woman. Whether you think it's real or not, it's real. It's me, you know, and, and, uh, I would just encourage anybody that ever that ever feels like that don't uh don't beat yourself up over it but don't put God in a box either. God'll break out of your box, believe me. <laughs> you can't even get a little bit in there. <laughs> you know? So let me get on with my message. <clears throat> so Jesus is talking about this great banquet, right? And he says, they were all invited, but they all made excuses. They were all invited, but they all made excuses. And up here in, in Luke 12, 35 through 36, like I said, it was talking about be dressed, be ready for service, and have your fires burning. 
what that have your fires burning means is they would, they had to light lamps, oil lamps, and walk around with these oil lamps so that they could see. But if they didn't have their lamps, they couldn't see where they were going. And Jesus tells them, is telling this parable, and he says, basically, the bride, you are the bride, I'm the groom. If you're not ready, you can't go with me. You have to take steps to be ready to go with me. You've got to do things to be able to see where I'm going. Take steps. Don't be lazy. But then he says at this great banquet, they were all invited, but they all made excuses. That word all, they were all invited, it really means they were all invited. It means we're all invited. Not just all of us, but all, all of us are invited. But they made excuses. My question is, what is your excuse? And don't worry, this was, what's my excuse? But personalize it. What is your excuse? Why are we not going to God's banqueting table? Why are we choosing something else instead of going to his banquet? What are we thinking? I love Revelations 30, verse 20. And it's, it's Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever comes to the door brings me in. I'm going to eat with them, them with me. Who's standing at the door and knocking? Jesus is standing at our door and knocking. We're asking for more of him, and he's like, I'm right here knocking on your door. Let me in. Let me in. How much more of him are we going to need standing at our door and knocking? Well, are we wanting him too with everything else? Maybe there's not room in there. Jesse told a, uh, on one of his messages, he talked about how there's, there's not room. There's not room for him in here because of all the stuff that we want to keep at the same time. We want to keep the things that, that we think make us feel good. We want to keep the things that, that bring us this temporary earthly pleasure. But that means that there's not room for him. He's a jealous God. People are like, God's not jealous. Yes, he is. He's absolutely a jealous God. That's why the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to have no other gods before me. You can't have any other gods before him. You know, we just can't. When we try, there's just not room for him. But I do want to encourage all of you that the love of God is coming after us. The love of God is coming after us. He's coming after you, where you are. He seeks you out. Adam in the garden, Adam and Eve, where are you guys? He seeks us out. He's coming after us because he wants us. Because he wants to spend that intimate, personal one-on-one -on -one time with us. We, we, have, we find that so hard to believe, but it's 100% true. He comes after us. We're like, why would he come after us? Because he made you. He literally made you and fashioned you. It's so awesome. He, he made us for him. But something that I want to remind us is that he's coming after others that aren't like us, too. Let me say that again. He's coming after others that aren't like us. I know in my mind, I think, well, God looks just like me. He must. Nope. Not even close, I'm sure. But I look a little bit like him. 
Every single one of you look a little bit like him. All of us do. And he's coming after those that don't look anything like us, that don't act like us. I'm getting ahead of myself. Are we ready for that? Are we ready for him to come after us? Are we ready for him to come after those that don't look like us, that aren't like us? Are we prepared to spend time with him, with people that aren't like us? We want more of him when we prepare our hearts and we say, God, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, are we ready for whatever it takes? This sure won't look like what we think it's going to look like. I mean, if there's one thing that's for sure, that's it. <laughs> we don't know. Are we ready for that? Because we can't grow if we're not ready for it. We can't expand if we're not ready for it. We can't be who he's called us to be if we're not ready for it. Are we hungry for him? And this hunger isn't just a, hmm, I'd like to have some McDonald's french fries right now. I'm hungry for some McDonald's french fries. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking like you're, you're going to die if you don't get him, if you don't eat him. He says, my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. I'm not talking take a bite out of him, but he is. We're supposed to devour the word so that we can be like him. We're supposed to eat it up. We're supposed to spend this time with him to be like him. Are we hungry for him? Or are we hungry for what he can do for us? There's a big difference, a huge difference. But I will tell you this truth. When we're hungry for him, and, and him alone, the stuff that he can do for us is just going to come. It's just going to be the, the side product of that. It's just going to come out of that. But that can't be what we focus on. It can't be. If it is, we're not going to find him because we're focused on it. And those are the gods above him. These things are the gods above him. When we seek him, we will find him when we seek for him with all of our heart, with all of our heart, letting ourselves go, letting these desires, these fleshly desires go, not until then, not until then will we find him. He says, you will find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. When, can't take that when out of there. It's got to be all of it. Look at when God came and delivered the Israelites time and time again. It was when they were literally at the rock bottom. They couldn't do anything else. They're so oppressed. They're so in great bondage that they have nothing else but to cry out to God. And they did. Their heart was at that place. God, I need you. I need you. I need you, I want you. And he heard their cries, and he went and answered them. When we ask, give us more of you, God. Man, we gotta be ready. Because if you think about it, He is in us. He's around us, above us, below us. But we're asking for more of Him, and He literally gave us already His one and only Son, the most precious, who is God, who truly is God. He gave us Jesus, who is absolutely God. He gave us himself. He gave us Jesus. Then Jesus says, you know what? He breathes on us and gives us the Holy Spirit, which is God who's now in us. And we're asking for more of him. Guys, he loves us so much that he gave us his only son. 
He's forgiven us of our sins. That's how much he loves us. We want more, and he's forgiven us of our sins. He created us for relationship with him, and he gives us the ability to do all things in him. But that's the key, in him. We can do all things in him. In him and through him. So um, Rod sent me this uh, this guy that was talking about this uh, this preacher that helped develop the Jesus movement and everything. And uh, Lonnie Frisbee, some of you guys have probably heard of him, but this guy's name is John Rutke. I guess I'm saying that right. Sorry if I'm not. But this guy, he said something really profound, and it, it stood out to me so much that I, I really wanted to share it with you because to have this healthy body, to have this healthy church where we get to come and we get to be fed we get to join together, the joining together of the saints. You are saints, believe it or not. We are saints. And God tells us to not neglect the coming together of the saints. But when we do this, there's right ways to do it. There's wrong ways to do it. We've seen so much of wrong examples, you know, and that's because we're humans. I'm telling you, there's probably going to be wrong examples that come from me, unfortunately. I apologize for that in advance, but I promise you that I try my best to listen and be, be attentive to the Holy Spirit, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and to bring truth. And so, uh, what this John guy said, he was talking about the Spirit and talking about truth. So, back during the, the, the Jesus movement, whenever that was really kicking off in the late 60s, 70s, you know, in the 80s, as this is growing up, like people hadn't, they hadn't experienced this move of God before. And they started experiencing the Holy Spirit starting to break out. And they're like, wow, what is going on? This is so awesome. And that's, I'm like, yes. The Holy Spirit is incredible. And he does some seriously incredible things. But if we focus so much on one thing and not on all the things, you know, all of God and his attributes, and we just focus one area, then things can go a little sideways. Or if we try to shun something out and just focus on this because it's, it's more comfortable for us, well, then things don't really go the way that God wants them to go. And so he put it like this. He says, if you have the spirit without truth, you'll blow up. And I'm not talking get big and great and all that. I'm talking you'll destruct. If you have the Holy Spirit without truth, you will blow up. But if you have the truth without spirit, you'll dry up. God wants them both. But when you put the two together, you will grow up. You'll grow up. In strength, you'll grow up in wisdom, knowledge, understanding, in moving in the Spirit, you'll be able to be in tune with God and know what He really wants, what He expects through His Word, and then be able to have the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver it, however that looks, when we put them both together. And I love that about this church. This church here is, that's what we try to do. We try to balance things out, put them together, and let God move the way He wants to move in spirit and in truth. As we do that, we're going to grow mentally, emotionally, spiritually. As the body here, we're going to grow. That's, it's just going to be a product, uh, a byproduct of doing that. You guys, so we have to be ready for that. But like Rod said last week, he said, if you want true revival, there is a cost to it. There must be a change that comes along with it. If we want true revival, there's a cost that comes along with it. And a true change must come. There's got to be a true change. So, does anybody in here, you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to think about this question. Is anybody in here, do you, do you feel like, well, right where we are is exactly where God wants us? 
He doesn't want us to grow any more spiritually, emotionally. He doesn't want us to grow any more as a body. Um, we're good where we are. We're nice, we're comfortable, and we feel like we're doing exactly what God wants us to do. I personally don't feel like that. I personally feel like we have to always be hungering. We have to always be striving, thirsting for more of what God wants in us. And that means I have to accept the fact that I must change. I must change. I haven't arrived. I'm not going to arrive until we're standing there together going, that's Jesus. That's Moses. That's, you know, like until we're there, we still have to change personally. Inside and out, we have to continue to change. That's one thing that's not going to change is we have to change. All of us, every single one of us. Change sometimes can be frightening. I get that. But the change has to be in our hearts, and it has to be true, and it has to be lasting change. True change, lasting change in our hearts. Because it takes every single one of us to continue to step where God tells us to step, when he tells us, how he tells us. It takes all of us. God put us all together for a reason. That's for all of us to sharpen each other, for all of us to build each other up. It's not an, by accident that you are here, whether it's online or here in this, in this church today. We're part of this church. God has brought every single one of us for a specific purpose. You have purpose. You absolutely have purpose. And we want every one of you here. So, with that being said, I, I've got a question for you. And this is for all of us. This question is for all of us. Are we going to wait for the world to change around us? Are we going to look around and list all the reasons why everyone else needs to change except us? Or are we going to be the change that God's calling for? Because I can promise you, we can look out at the world. We don't even have to look very far. And we can find all these things that we think needs to change with everybody else. But it's not until we take that mirror and put it right here that we're going to start seeing the change that God wants to see, that God's calling us for. I truly do believe that we are going to have to take a good hard look within ourselves and ask God to help us truly change our hearts to be more like Him. That's in everything. That's in everything, guys. That's in our relationships. The way that we treat each other. Our families, our spouses, our kids, our parents. But not just them. Everybody around. You know, it sounds cliche, but that, that bracelet, what would Jesus do? Man, that should be something, like I need a hat that I wear that sticks out and drops down, and it's like clear, but it says, what would Jesus do so that in every single situation I'm in, everybody's like, why do you preach up here with a picture of Jesus on the front? Why is he there every single day? Because I want to remember that he's there every single day, and I don't want to step outside of that. Am I going to be perfect in that? No, I'm not, but I can be a whole lot more like him. I can be a whole lot more like him. And we have to understand that we have to be that. We want the world to change around us, but are we willing to put in what it takes to change the world around us? We can't keep going through life like everything's fine and not be the change that he's called us to be. And if truly... Listen to me, truly, if truly it is his kindness that leads us to repentance, if it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, 
And if we've truly been commissioned to make disciples of all nations, that, that all nations is all types of people. All types of people. And we've been called to baptize them and to teach them to obey Him. Then we also have the responsibility to be the Father's representation of His love, of His kindness, of His forgiveness, of His acceptance of all nations on this earth. And, and hear me, though. Whenever I say an accepting people of all nations on this earth, people that are different than us, when I say accepting, I'm not saying accepting their sins, but I'm saying but truly loving them enough to not let them stay in their sin. But guys, how can we do that if we don't have this personal relationship with them? How can we do that? Are you going to listen to anybody that, that talks down on you, that treats you like you're a loser, that doesn't, they, they treat you like you disgust them or like they disgust you? Are you going to listen to anybody that treats you in that way? No. So we have to treat people in the way that they are going to accept. We've got to treat them in the way that if Jesus was standing right here with us, how would Jesus treat them? How would he love on them? How would his kindness lead them to repentance? And we have to say, does my kindness to people lead them to repentance? How can my kindness love them enough to not let them stay where they are? How can my kindness, how can they receive that kindness so much that they know that it's genuine, that they know that I have their best interest in mind because of how kind I am to them, and that leads them to not want to do what they were doing? But if what I'm doing looks just like what they're doing, are they going to feel like they need to change anything? No. But if I'm doing what they're doing and telling them that they need to do something different, then I'm a hypocrite. And that's, what this, that's literally what the church gets accused of all the time. It's full of a bunch of hypocrites. But we have to understand that it's because the way we look at people, the way we shun people, the way we talk to them, talk down on them, all these things, that's not representing God's kindness. It doesn't lead anyone to repentance. Maybe some of you are awesome at that. I know some of you are awesome at, at loving people, at loving them well, loving them the way that God loves them. Many of you actually do. So please don't feel condemnation about any of this, okay? But we've got to allow God to work through us. Work through us. And by not letting people stay in their sins, this actually means helping them walk through the transitions from death to life. It doesn't just mean saying, buying them a Happy Meal and saying, hey, be fed, feel great. This is what you need to change, see you later. That's the easy part. The hard part is walking them, walking with them through that transition when they're people that we otherwise really wouldn't like to hang around. And I say all this because if we don't, who will? Everybody's like, oh, God's so big, he will definitely send somebody, somebody else. He'll send somebody else. Is that a good excuse? Is that an excuse for us? If God tells us to do something, to say, it's all right, God, I know you told me to, but God's going to send somebody else to do it. It's like the trash can is full. I'm going to put one more thing in there. It should go out, but God's going to send somebody else to take that trash can. <laughs> you know what I mean? When we know dang good and well, it's probably our responsibility. We use the last little bit of toilet paper. My responsibility, put it back, but I don't, you know. 
Somebody else is going to do it. Somebody else is going to throw that toilet paper on there. Yep. But you should have done it. Same thing. When God calls us to do something, we know that it's our responsibility. It's up to us to do it. It's up to us, not somebody else. Will God use somebody else? Maybe. But maybe that person will burn in hell because you didn't. Is that not a possibility? He's called us to affect our area of influence. Us. Our area of influence. Isaiah 6, 8 says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? God himself is asking, Who should I send? We got to understand that the people that God is calling us to, these people might stink. They might be rude. They might not look like you, dress like you, talk like you, think like you. They might not. In fact, they most likely won't. But I will tell you this. They are 100% sons and daughters of the Most High God regardless of what we think about them. He loves them more than we can possibly fathom. He loves them. The people that we don't like, He loves them. The people that annoy us, He loves them. The people we just can't stand to be around because they get under your skin, He loves them passionately. Why does he love them? Because they literally are his children. They literally are his children. And think about your own children and people that want to treat your own children poorly. You don't take very kindly to that, do you? No, of course not. He made them, though. <laughs> the God that created everything made Everybody. He made all of them. And he says that I don't want one of them to perish. I don't want one of them to die without a relationship with me. Not even one. Not even the one that stinks, that you don't like, that's annoying, that's disgusting. Those people, he doesn't want them to perish. He doesn't want them to perish. He made them literally in his image and in his likeness. They might not look like you, but they look like him. They might not be like you, but they're like him. Isn't that incredible? They're his bride. They're his bride. And he wants his bride. He loves his bride, regardless of what you think about him or him. He delights in them. When we don't, he does. He delights in them, just like he delights in you. They look like him. They sound like him. They are like him. People. What separate us? What sep separates us from the animals? He didn't make the animals in his image and in his likeness. He didn't breathe the breath of life into them like he did into us. We have a, a spirit because he wants us to live with him forever throughout eternity. When we love people, we literally are touching the very heart of God. He wants us to love one another. Not just those of us that are in this room. Those other Christians that maybe are a 
the de a different denomination than us. Maybe they believe slightly different than us. Isn't it, isn't it amazing to think that we think that we have it all together, like we know exactly what God wants and how he wants his church to be and how we do it is exactly how Jesus would do it if he was here today? We got to ask ourselves, seriously, really? I'm not saying it's wrong what we're doing, but I am saying it might not look exactly like what he would have it look like if he was standing here today. But when we're loving people, that's what makes the big difference. That's what literally reaches out and touches his heart, and he says, I love that. Oh, I love that. I love that you love my creation, the people that I've created. I love that. You see, this is who we're called to be, and this is how we do what we've been called to do. So get ready. Get ready. Ask him to help get you ready. But you have to take steps too. We can't just say, God, I know you're going to do everything. You just zap me and make me exactly the way you want me to be so that I can do exactly what you've called me to do. We have to take steps. We've got to seek him daily. We've got to get in the word daily. We've got to worship our Savior daily. We have to literally listen to the word, eat it up as much as we can. We've got to make some changes. We have to discipline our own flesh. We've got to discipline our own flesh so that we will be hungry and thirsty for him. I'm going to break down Isaiah 6, 1 through 9. We'll wrap up very shortly after that. But Isaiah 6, 1 through 9. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. No, before I get started, please, please, please. Allow your creative mind to take yourself there. If you need to close your eyes and picture this, let your mind literally paint the picture for you, then close your eyes and paint the picture, okay? This is extreme. This is significant. God showed Isaiah a picture into heaven. You want to know what heaven's like? Picture this. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, he was seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the entire temple. Above him, above God, seated on his throne, were two seraphim, which are angels. Two mighty angels were above God, and each of them had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces... With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying above God. We think of angels as these sweet, petite, pretty little, blonde-haired ladies. That's wrong. 100% wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. These seraphim were mighty and majestic, and they were above God. Not above God, but they were literally flying above God. And they were calling to one another in the throne room of God. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. That's what these two magnificent angels were saying to one another back and forth back and forth, filling the throne room of heaven. They're saying, God, our God is so holy, he's so magnificent, that he literally fills the whole earth with his glory. They said earth so that, that Isaiah could wrap his head around it, I think. He fills the entire earth more than the universe. He fills everything with his glory. And then, get this, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook. The temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me. Woe to me, 
says Isaiah. He is tripping now. He's seeing this, and he says, Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. I'm going to die, he says. I'm going to be totally, completely destroyed. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Seeing him, being in his presence, he felt completely, 100%, he knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's going to die. He's going to be crushed and destroyed. Why? Because he knew he was a man of unclean lips. Because of what comes out of his mouth is not holy enough to be in the presence of this almighty God. Not only that, but he lives among people that are unclean and not worthy to be in the presence of this almighty God. And he knew the power that he's experiencing, the shaking, the rumbling, the threshold, simply of them calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, he was going to be crushed and destroyed. That he could not stand in this presence. He didn't deserve to stand in this presence. He wasn't worthy to stand in this presence. And neither are you. And neither am I. But, as he's saying this, my eyes have seen the, the King, the Lord Almighty. One of the seraphim, as he's saying this and he's experiencing this, one of these majestic beings that God created, that he spoke into existence, flies down. He takes, uh, he flew to me with a live coal in his hand. A live coal, a burning hot ember in his hand flies up to him, he took it from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sins are atoned for. From the fire of the altar, God sent his angel. God sent him to do this. This angel didn't make this decision on his own. They don't get to make decisions on their own. They do what he says, when he says, how he says, where he says, to whom he says. So God's heart was to make Isaiah pure and clean, to purify him, to cleanse him. He says, he touched my mouth. See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins are atoned for. God purified him in his presence, not because of what Isaiah did, Although Isaiah was trembling and humbling himself before the Lord, not being proud and arrogant, saying, yeah, I can be here. I'm good enough. I can stand in your presence, God. You don't scare me. No, that's not what he was doing. So then, after he was purified, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, so all this just took place, and then Isaiah says, I hear the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here, I, here am I, send me. It wasn't before he was purified. It was after he was purified. He humbled himself, God cleansed him, and he realized, I can go. I'll do whatever you want me to do because you just purified me, because you removed my sins from me, because I was bound for hell. I was bound for death. There was no way I'd be able to survive this. But you, God, you cleansed me and you purified me. You made me righteous and right standing to where I can be in your presence. So if you want it done, I was a dead man. And now I'm not because of you. If you want it done... Let's go. I'll go. I will go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. That's where this heart came from. Who shall I send and who will go for us? Send me, God. Because no one can do what you do. And now you've, you've purified me. Now I know I can do what you want me to do. Because you've cleansed me. 
God's given us all these spiritual giants in our lives. You know, we might feel like that, that what God's called us to do is too difficult for us. It is. If he's called you to do it, it's too difficult for you to do. I'll just tell you that. Just get it out of the way, okay? You can't do it on your own. But he's given us spiritual giants to lead us, to help guide us, to teach us the word, to show us the word, to show us the ways to life, to break down the word of God for us. Some of my spiritual giants are obviously Pastor Rod and Michael Jones, Jerry Nash, Jim Dula, Dela, sorry, Pastor Tom Manns, my father-in-law, Danny, my wife, awesome spiritual giant, my mom, several others that I glean from, several others that I glean from. And we might think, well, how am I supposed to do anything? God put people in your lives to help you. Go to them. Tell them what you feel like that God's asking you to do or telling you or guiding you and directing you to do. Ask them to pray with you, to pray over you, to help give you the strength and the courage to step out and do what it is. And I want to ask you guys, who are, who are some of the spiritual giants in your lives? Because he's put people there for you. I'm not saying they should take the place of God. Because they shouldn't. But they can certainly help. You know, the word tells us that iron sharpens iron. As one man sharpens another. Or one woman sharpens another. So we have to have these. And maybe you are the spiritual giant in someone else's life. He put people in your lives for you to be able to glean from. But he also put people in your lives for you to lead. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how inexperienced or how experienced you are. God's put you there to encourage people and to show them the love of God. To show them who God is to you and who he wants to be to them. Everything has got to come back to Jesus. Everything's got to come back to Jesus. Jesus shows us he is the direct physical representation of God the Father. The Holy Spirit shows us Jesus. Everything that we do should point people to Jesus. It's okay if you're not perfect because his blood covers all of that. It doesn't give us a free ticket to do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want. But his blood does cover our sin. And it should just draw us closer to him. Closer and closer and closer to him. We've got to get ready for more of Jesus. We've got to get ready for more of the Holy Spirit to move to reveal the Father to more people. We're going to see it in this room, but it's got to be taken out of this room. And it might have to start out there and work its way in here. Okay? I love you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you will just reveal to us through your Holy Spirit exactly what you have for each of us. God, I pray that you will get us ready, that you will help us to get ready for whatever you have for us. God, I pray that you will remove preconceived ideas out of our minds, God. I pray that you will fill our minds with your, with your ideas. Fill our minds with your visions of what you want for us, what you want for this, this body of Christ here, what you want for your church across this town and this county, this state and this country and this world, Lord. I pray that all of us will surrender ourselves to you today and that we truly will do whatever you want, wherever you want, whenever you want, God. Lord, help us to die to our flesh so that we can be crucified with Christ. And that's no longer us that lives, but that it's Christ that lives in us and through us, God, through the power and the strength of your Holy Spirit, Lord.
I pray that the actions that we take, Lord, the words of our mouths, the things that we do and speak and and um, feel in our hearts, Lord, I pray that those things will just bring glory and honor to your name. Help us, God, to bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you that you've chosen us, that you see us every day, every second, that you never leave us and you never forsake us, Lord. God, I pray that you will prepare us for more of you in our lives. Help us to give you more room. Help us to give you all the room in our lives. God, give us divine appointments and opportunities to be able to go out and take your love and a relationship with you to the world, to everywhere we go, to the gas stations, the grocery stores, the restaurants, to our work, to our schools, to our families, to our homes. Help us to represent you well, God. And Lord, please do. Please do wreck us. Please do show up in ways that we haven't experienced before, in ways that we haven't seen before. We give you the platform, God. We give you the room. Help us to never neglect your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget to pick up your kids. We will play probably a couple worship songs and stuff. You can feel free to enter into worship. If you want anything, uh, want prayer for anything at all, don't hesitate to come up. Come up. If you want to pray right where you are, pray right where you are. If you want to dance and sing and shout and worship, dance and sing and shout and worship. Okay? Greet this place as the altars before you. And, uh, yeah, we love you guys. See ya.